Learning Languages, Nazim Aziz. I was only seven when my family came here. I'd never been to school in Pakistan, and I suppose I started learning English straight away when I started school here. I never actually learned it. I was just chucked in with a lot of English kids. I reckon they thought I was really thick at first, but I didn't understand a word. Anyway, I just picked it up. It's weird because I haven't got a Pakistani accent. That's because I didn't learn English there. Some families use English at home in Pakistan, and they'll never lose their accent. Everybody says I sound like a Liverpoolian because I went to school in Liverpool, and I've always lived here. Bernard Lefort. I have studied English since uh, for five years in France. We studied at school and we learned the grammar and we, um, we translated everything into French. I started at the age of 12. I think I do not speak well. I am very uh, slowly uh, slow, but I can understand everything I read very good, very well. I do not like to make mistakes, so I do not speak too much. I am living in Paris, and I meet English people in my work. I have a very French accent, but this is not important. I am a French, and I am happy when people know this. Anyway, uh, the English, I think French accents are very romantic, yes? Luciana Rossi. I am Italian. I was born in Rome. I studied English at school. I began to study at 13. All our lessons were in English. The teacher only translated some difficult words. I think I had a good basis at school, and then I went to England for the summer. At the beginning, everybody spoke very quickly, and I couldn't understand much, but after a few days, it was easier and everything I had learned came back to me. I didn't go to a school in England, but I met my husband there. He's Scottish, and I thought his accent was very difficult at first. Now it's no problem. We live in Scotland. Jesus Garcia. I didn't study English at school in Mexico, and I started to learn at evening classes when I was 22. It was only two evenings a week, but I enjoyed the lessons. After two or three years, I went on holiday to the States and picked up a lot of expressions. Then I saved up and went to a language school in England for two months of 25 hours a week. There were all different nationalities in my class, and we had to speak English. Anyway... I reckon my English is okay now. I work in Mexico City, and I use English a lot in my job. I'm a travel agent. Shark Attack California lifeguard Kazmir Pulaski was paddling with his surfboard in the Pacific Ocean off San Luis Obispo when a shark attacked him. I had swum about 13 miles and I was about a mile and a half out when suddenly something came straight up out of the water, knocking me off my surfboard and into the air. I didn't know it was a shark until I surfaced again. Then I saw this big fish swimming around with my surfboard in its mouth. I could see its long gray dorsal fin, and I thought, oh my God, it's a great white shark. The next thought was, nobody gets this close to a great white and lives to tell the tale. You just don't know what you're going to do in a situation like mine. I saw the shark coming towards me with my surfboard in its jaws. I grabbed the tail of the surfboard and climbed back on it. I don't know why. Then I was afraid that if the shark let go of the board, he'd go for me. I got on my knees on the tail of the board, trying to keep my balance, because all the time he's shaking the board, trying to get me off it. I was starting to fall back in the water, where I'd be easy meat for him, 
so I moved up to the center of the board where I could hold onto the rail. But I slipped back two or three inches, and that's when I whacked him on the nose. I, I just open-handed slapped him on the nose. It was more an automatic reaction than a deliberate slap. It was like something was taking over my body. I was just six inches away from his teeth, but it was the eyes I remember most. It seemed as though he wasn't looking at anything when he was looking at me. Anyway, I just went for him and whacked him, and about two or three seconds after I hit him, he went. For a minute, I really thought I'd had it. I might have seen my life pass in front of me a little bit. And after he went, I started paddling back to the beach, but I was waiting for him to come back again. They were the worst moments. Then I kind of knew he wasn't coming back, and I managed to get to the beach. I stood up and looked at my hands and feet, practically counted my fingers and toes to make sure everything was intact. I couldn't believe I got away without a scratch. When I recovered my surfboard later, it had big teeth marks in it. A biologist who investigated said the bite mark was probably from a great white about 18 feet long. <sighs> I had nightmares that night, but the next day I was back in the ocean. I love it. Even before the attack, I'd reckoned it was silly to worry about sharks because attacks are so rare. I still feel that. The Yellow Bulldozer The house stood on a slight rise just on the edge of the village. It stood on its own and looked out over a broad spread of West Country farmland. Not a remarkable house by any means. It was about thirty years old, squattish, squarish, made of brick, and had four windows set in the front of a size and proportion which more or less exactly failed to please the eye. The only person for whom the house was in any way special was Arthur Dent, and that was only because it happened to be the one he lived in. On Wednesday night it had rained very heavily, the lane was wet and muddy, but the Thursday morning sun was bright and clear as it shone on Arthur Dent's house for what was to be the last time. It hadn't properly registered yet with Arthur that the council wanted to knock it down and build a bypass instead. At eight o'clock on Thursday morning, Arthur didn't feel very good. He woke up blearily, got up, wandered blearily round his room, opened a window, saw a bulldozer, found his slippers, and stomped off to the bathroom to wash. Toothpaste on the brush, so, scrub. Shaving mirror, pointing at the ceiling. He adjusted it. For a moment it reflected a second bulldozer through the bathroom window. Properly adjusted, it reflected Arthur Dent's bristles. He shaved them off, washed, dried, and stomped off to the kitchen to find something pleasant to put in his mouth. Kettle, plug, fridge, milk, coffee, yawn. The word bulldozer wandered through his mind for a moment in search of something to connect with. The bulldozer outside the kitchen window was quite a big one. He stared at it. Yellow, he thought, and stomped off back to his bedroom to get dressed. Passing the bathroom, he stopped to drink a large glass of water, and another. He began to suspect that he was hungover. Why was he hungover? Had he been drinking the night before? He supposed that he must have been. He caught a glint in the shaving mirror. Yellow, he thought and stomped on to the bedroom. He stood and thought. The pub, he thought. Oh dear, the pub. He vaguely remembered being angry, angry about something that seemed important. He'd been telling people about it, telling people about it at great length, he rather suspected. His clearest visual recollection was of glazed looks on other people's faces. Something about a new bypass he'd just found out about. It had been in the pipeline for months, only no one seemed to have known about it. Ridiculous. He took a swig of water. It would sort itself out, he decided. No one wanted a bypass. The council didn't have a leg to stand on. It would sort itself out. 
God, what a terrible hangover he'd had earned him, though. He looked at himself in the wardrobe mirror. He stuck out his tongue. Yellow, he thought. The word yellow wandered through his mind in search of something to connect with. Fifteen seconds later he was out of the house and lying in front of a big yellow bulldozer that was advancing up his garden path. The rumor. <laughs> I'm afraid Mr. Joyce isn't here. He's gone to the hospital to see his grandmother. Is Mr. Joyce here? No, he's gone to the hospital. Oh, he wanted me to wash his car. Did he leave the keys? His car isn't here, I'm afraid. The police towed it away. Did you hear that Mr. Joyce had gone to hospital? No. What happened? A car crash, I think. Anyway, the police have towed away the wreckage. Oh, dear. I saw an ambulance on my way to work. Have you heard about Mr. Joyce? He was rushed to hospital by ambulance at 8.45 this morning. He had a serious car crash. Perhaps we should send Mr. Joyce something. How about some fruit? I saw some very nice strawberries this morning. I was told that Joyce was allergic to strawberries. Has anyone told you about Mr. Joyce? No. What about him? He crashed his car. It's a complete write-off. He's in hospital. Intensive care, I heard. Ooh, are they going to operate? Well, I'm not sure. I heard that he's got a lot of allergies. Did you know about poor Mr. Joyce? He's in hospital after a terrible car crash, but they can't operate because he's allergic to antibiotics. My sister was treated for her allergies by a Swiss specialist. Do you know how Mr. Joyce is? Oh, you've heard too. Bad news travels fast. I hear that he needs to see a Swiss specialist. That's going to be expensive. Yes, but there are 3,000 people working here. Let's have a collection to raise the money. We're collecting for Mr. Joyce. Who's he? He works in the accounts department. He had an awful crash. They're flying a surgeon in from Geneva. He'll never work again. Oh, dear. Well, here's a pound. Hello, where is everyone? I've got no idea, Mr. Joyce. How was your grandmother? Oh, she was fine. Wasn't a heart attack, just indigestion, that's all. Mm, I'd better go and collect my car from the police station. You know, I'd only parked on a double yellow line while I was getting her some flowers and they towed it away. The Explorer Good evening, and welcome to the Patrick Logan Show. On tonight's show, we're going to meet Broderick Foyle, the scientist who believes influenza comes from outer space. Moira Robinson, the author of Super Housewife. And we're going to hear the latest song from Shining Teeth. Our first guest needs little introduction from me. He's climbed Mount Everest, gone down the Amazon by canoe, and crossed the Sahara Desert on foot. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Richard Mills. <laughs> Richard, welcome. You've been everywhere and you've done everything. 
And now your latest book has just been published, hasn't it? That's right, Patrick. It's called Miles of Sand. I've been reading it this week, and there are some pretty fantastic stories in it. They're all true, Patrick, all true. <laughs> I'm sure they are. I particularly like the story of your rescue. Could you tell us that one? Yes. I was crossing the Sahara on foot when it happened. I had a small radio, but it packed up after ten days or so, and I just kept on going. Obviously, when I didn't call in, people began to worry, and they sent out a search party. Now, I was travelling at night and sleeping during the day. On this particular morning, I had set up my tent and just crashed out. I'd been sleeping for a couple of hours when the search party arrived, and I didn't hear their truck. What happened was I woke up and heard these voices outside the tent. Someone said, I had a look. He's dead, I reckon. <laughs> Who, me? I shouted and popped my head out of the tent. You should have seen their faces. They were even more surprised when I refused to lift from them. Uh, but they did give me a new radio. <laughs> so what are you doing at the moment, Richard? I'm keeping pretty busy. I'm writing a book about the Everest trip, and I'm preparing for my next expedition. The next one? You mean there's somewhere you haven't been? Oh, yes. I'm planning to walk across the polar ice cap via the North Pole. You're going to walk? That's right. I'm still looking for sponsors at the moment. It's going to be pretty expensive. <laughs> it sounds like a very ambitious project to me. Yes, it is. The most difficult yet. You see, the temperature goes down to minus 75 degrees centigrade, and at that sort of temperature, metal freezes to the flesh. Mm. And, of course, I'll be walking across the sea on ice. <laughs> How are you preparing for that? I train every day. I run ten miles and do weight training. I shall have to be very fit indeed. <laughs> what sort of problems are you anticipating? Well, first, there's navigation. Compasses don't work near the poles, so I'll be using satellite navigation throughout the trip. Say you have equipment problems, uh, like the radio in the Sahara. I'll have a sextant to navigate by the stars, but it'll be plastic, of course. Ah, yes. You said metal freezes to the flesh. Yes. How long will it take? At the beginning, I'll be covering ten miles a day. I won't be able to keep that up all the way, but I'll have reached the pole by mid-July. By then, I'll have been walking for six weeks, say three months for the whole journey. One thing that interests me, you always have such wonderful photographs in your books. Will you be taking photos on this trip? I'll be filming myself during the entire trip. Oh, but how will you manage that? I'll simply put the camera on a tripod. And food? Will you be trying to shoot polar bears? I certainly hope not. An aircraft will be dropping supplies to me at regular intervals. If the weather's good enough, that is. Rather you than me, Richard. Can we look forward to a book about this trip? I hope so. Any ideas about a title? Miles of Snow, perhaps? Actually, that's a possibility. Thank you for talking to us, Richard. I hope you'll come back and tell us about the trip. And we'll be back after the break. Describing a picture. One. Well, I really go for posters. I've got five or six in my room. Some of them are really cheap, 75p or something. The most I ever paid was £2.50, but that's not the point. If you get fed up with them, you can always change them. You can get all sorts of posters. There are the old adverts, or photos of rock stars, or just beautiful landscapes. I've got a photograph of a seagull flying over some waves with a slogan on it, Everything is beautiful. Ones I like best, though, are the old Vogue magazine covers of the, the 1920s, I think. There's one marvellous one of a girl. She's very geometric, in a yellow kind of dress, against a gorge, a lovely pale blue background. She's on an ocean liner, I suppose. Two. Yes. We've got a picture. Horses. We bought it in Walco. It's got a lovely frame. Kind of brown cloth with a strip of gold running around it. It was only about 30 quid. I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. They say it's an original painting, but I reckon they do them on a production line. We just decorated the room and it, it matched the wallpaper. That sounds a bit odd, but why not? Anyway, I've always liked horses. Three. I bought that years ago. 
It's by Van Gogh. It was pretty reasonable, really. About seven pounds. And that included the block mounting. I know it's only a cheap reproduction, but I've always loved that painting. There was a reproduction at school. It's the colours, I suppose, and the texture. You can see the thickness of the paint, even if it's only a reproduction. Anyway, I'd rather have a cheap copy of a, well, a masterpiece than an original of something that's, that's mediocre. Four. We haven't really gone in for many pictures. You see, we've always been in rented flats, and it hasn't seemed worth it. Well, a calendar in the kitchen with views of Scotland, perhaps, uh, and that collage of family photos. Maybe a poster over a damp patch on the wall. What I do buy, though, is books. Books of paintings. This is from a Beryl Cook book. Isn't it lovely? There's such a sense of humour, a, a kind of childlike quality that I really love. Five. That's a screen print. It's a limited edition, actually. That means they print perhaps a hundred and then destroy the plates. This particular one appealed to me very strongly. There's something so clean and simple about it. Photorealism. I love it. My husband says it does nothing for him. He thinks it's pretty awful, in fact. But then again, he hasn't got much taste. Not when it comes to art. How do I get to... One... You pay over here, Mum. All right, all right. Uh, come on, keep together. One adult and two children, please. One ninety. Um, haven't you got anything smaller? Uh, no, no. I'm afraid I haven't. Hmm. One ninety, two, three, four, five, and five is ten, and ten is twenty. Thank you. Uh, which way? Just go through the door on your right. Follow the signs and you'll see everything. Mum, I want a drink and a biscuit. Me too, I'm starving. Um, excuse me, is there a refreshment room? It's just round the corner on the right. I want to see the mummies first. What? The mummies, the Egyptian ones. Um... Yes? We were particularly interested in seeing the mummies. Could you direct us to the Egyptian room? It's the last room you come to. Yes, but we'd like to go there first. All right. Turn left when you get in. It's the first door you'll come to on the left. Thank you. Sorry. Two. Excuse me. Yes, love? I think I'm a bit lost. I've been wandering around for ages, trying to find the tea. The tea? <laughs> right, love. It's in the... Uh, let me see. One, two, three, four, five. The sixth aisle along from here. Or is it the seventh? If you go this way, past the checkouts, you'll find it on the right. I've been all around there. It's just past the biscuits. On the middle shelf. Oh, thank you very much, dear. I'm getting on a bit. I can't see as well as I could. <laughs> oh, well. Come with me, love. I'll take you there. Three. One liter of whiskey, two hundred Marlboro, two bottles of wine. Which currency are you paying in, sir? Uh, do you take Canadian dollars? Oh, well, yes, sir, but I'll have to give you the change in Dutch guilders. Sterling or American dollars, I'm afraid. Oh, dear. Uh, yes, of course. And I've only got a one hundred dollar bill. Are you in a hurry, sir? Not particularly. Why? Well, you could break your bill at the currency change desk and come back for your duty-free goods. That's a good idea. Thanks. Where is it? It's right in the middle of the concourse. Just turn left out of here and walk towards C and D piers. You'll see it straight in front of you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Four. Yes, madam. Can I help you? I've got a connecting flight to London. B.A.E. Um, let me just find my ticket. Yes, it's BA-208. Right. Is your luggage checked through? Yes, it is. It leaves at 14.30 from gate 27 on Pier B. Smoking or non-smoking? Non-smoking. I prefer an aisle seat if you've got one. Yes, that's fine. Seat 5D. Ah. Is there somewhere to get a coffee? Of course. 
Right over in that corner, between B pier and A pier. Can you see it? Yes. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yes, sir. Can I help you? Five. Excuse me, miss? Yes, madam? I can't find the pet food. I expect I've just walked past it or something. Can you tell me where it is? Uh, pet food? Oh, it's opposite the frozen meat cabinet. The frozen meat? Well, where's that exactly? It's near the back. Look, just go towards the back of the shop, and it's the... Let me think. Uh, the second aisle in from the right-hand side. The pet food's about three-quarters of the way along, on your right. Thank you so much. Six. Excuse me. Yes, miss. I particularly wanted to see the Victorian room, but I seem to have missed it. It's in the far corner, miss. Just go out of that door and turn right. Walk through the main hall and you'll see two doors in front of you. Uh, go in the left-hand one. That's the Roman room. Ah, I've been in there already. Yes, uh, you must have come out of the wrong door. Uh, anyway, once you're in the Roman room, take the door on the left. That's the Victorian room. Thank you. Thank you very much. Raging Inferno. I'm sitting out on the road in front of my own house where I've lived for 13 or 14 years. And it's, it's going down in front of me. The roof is falling in. It's in flames and there's nothing I can do about it. And, and the flames are in the roof and, ah, oh, God damn it. It's just beyond belief. I, my own house and I, everything around is black. There are fires burning all around me. The language of advertising. A. Hello there. My name's Steve Newman, but I expect you know that. I have to entertain a lot. That's one of the problems of living in Beverly Hills. And after dinner, I always give my guests Max Caffeine Instant Coffee. Steve, this coffee's marvelous. It's so fresh. Where do you get it? Glad you like it, Raquel. It's my secret. B. I'm standing in a laundrette in Romley, Kent. It's Monday morning, and I've just asked ten housewives to do half their wash in fizz detergent with its new XR74 foam booster, and half in another leading brand. Well, all of them agreed that fizz with new XR74 washed whiter, cleaner, and fresher. Fizz with XR74. For families, use fizz. For families, use fizz. C. A country walk, a summer's day, the man you love, somewhere to sit, the sky is blue, your love is new. Make him happy with a Macbeth cigar, Macbeth with a masculine aroma of carefully selected tobaccos. D. Mom, I'm so bored. Do I have to stay in bed? Yes, dear. You've been ill. Sick children are always a problem. Help to give them energy and vitality again with Glucosone, the sparkling health drink with added vitamins and minerals. E. Did you enjoy your meal, sir? Thank you. May I have the bill? Here you are, sir. Hmm. I see. Uh, you take credit cards? Well, sir, that depends. Which card is it? It's an International Streamline Platinum card. Oh, in that case, of course we do. Thank you very much, sir.
And madam, do come again. F. Are you looking for a car that's prettier than a Polo, faster than a Ford, mightier than a Maestro, cheaper to run than a Renault? Then you're looking for the new BM Calypso. Phone your local dealer for a test drive, and if you buy a Calypso this month, he'll give you a free radio, a full tank of petrol, one year's road tax, and free number plates. G. All right, I went up the pub last night. They didn't have my favourite beer. Run out, they said. Have some of this Burgermaster lager, they said. What I said? Lager? Not for me. Go on, try some, they said. Well, I had a glass. Didn't think much of it, but I had another. Load of rubbish, I said. Try another, they said. I did. Awful, I said. I don't believe it, they said. Try another. This is the worst beer I've ever had, I said. Try another, we'll pay, they said. Now it's rubbish, I said, and staggered off into the night. <laughs> I was laughing. Five free glasses of Burgermaster, and it's not that bad. H. Don't forget, Johnson's January sale starts Monday the 28th of December in Johnson's stores in Bournemouth, Southampton, Portsmouth, Brighton and Canterbury. Johnson's January sale, 9 o'clock on the 28th. I. I want to talk to you tonight about a very personal problem. Foot odor. Do you suffer from smelly feet? I did. Until I discovered Malcolm's talcum powder. Now I don't walk around smelling like a piece of old cheese. Remember, for talcum, say, Malcolm. For talcum, say, Malcolm. J. Hi, Sandy. I love your hair. I've just washed it. Mine is always so dry and unmanageable. Yours looks so clean and natural. That's because I use Aerial Conditioner. It's naturally balanced for dry hair. It's been tested for years, and it's safe enough even for a child. I'll try some. Can I borrow yours? Buy some. You'll be surprised. It's the cheapest on the market. Britain from the air. Salisbury. Salisbury was one of the earliest new towns. The city was founded in 1220 to replace the town of Old Sarum, three miles to the north. Old Sarum had been founded by the Romans and developed by the Saxons, and was already an important town in the 11th and 12th centuries. The water supply was poor, though, and so the town was moved to its present site, where smaller rivers join the River Avon. The most striking feature is the cathedral, which was founded at the same time as the town. It was built between 1220 and 1258, and is thought to be one of the most beautiful in Europe. The spire is 404 feet high, making it the tallest church in Britain, and was added in 1334. The cathedral is 473 feet long. Salisbury is a market town for the surrounding agricultural area, and a shopping centre for the large numbers of military bases to the north of the city, on Salisbury Plain. It's also a tourist centre, because of the cathedral and old town, and because of Stonehenge, which is ten miles north-northwest of the city. It's situated in central southern England, about 30 miles inland from the south coast, and 83 miles west of London. The city centre is particularly pleasant, as a ring road takes heavy traffic away to the east. Carnarvon. Carnarvon is the usual spelling, that is C-A-E-R-N-A-R-F-O-N -E nowadays, although older maps use the English spelling C-A-E-R-N-A-R-V-O-N. As it's the centre of the area of Gwyneth, which is 75% Welsh-speaking, the Welsh spelling is preferred. Gwyneth, by the way, is G-W-Y-N-E-D-D. It's situated in North Wales and has always been an important strategic and military site. 
the Romans built a castle here in A.D. 78. The present castle was started by King Edward I in 1283 and completed in 1322. His son was born here in 1284 and became the first Prince of Wales. Prince Charles was invested as Prince of Wales at the castle on July 1, 1969. The castle at the top left is one of the finest surviving castles in Britain. The old town wall is still in good condition. The population is 10,500 and the town is a market centre and a tourism centre for the Snowdonia National Park. There is no railway, the nearest station being at Bangor, nine miles away. It's famous for sailing and fishing. Sea and river fishing are both excellent, which adds to the town's attractions. Durham Durham, in County Durham, is in the northeast of England, about 14 miles from Newcastle and 260 miles from London. It is built on a bend in the River Weir, and it grew around the Norman Castle, which was built in 1072 to protect England from the Scots. A wall blocked off the peninsula. The cathedral was begun in 1093, and has been called the finest Norman building in Britain, if not in Europe. The religious schools developed from the 15th century onwards, eventually becoming the University of Durham in 1832. It is England's third oldest university, after Oxford and Cambridge. Durham is an administration and market centre, and although it is surrounded by coal mining villages, it has remained reasonably quiet and beautiful. The present population is 24,777. Liverpool Liverpool is one of Britain's largest cities. The city population is 605,600, but the population of the Merseyside conurbation is more than one and a quarter million. Its most famous inhabitants are probably John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ringo Starr, and Liverpool has built a one million pound Beatles museum. Its fame in the world of football is as widespread as its fame in pop music, with Liverpool Football Club being the most successful European team of the late 70s and early 80s, winning the European Cup three times. However, there's a lot more to Liverpool than just music and football. It developed very quickly in the 18th and 19th century as Britain's major Atlantic port. It was a centre for the cotton trade and manufacturing industry, as well as a centre for ships taking part in the infamous slave trade. At one time, there were seven miles of continuous docks along the River Mersey. The river is crossed by two tunnels, a railway tunnel built in 1886 and a road tunnel, the Mersey Tunnel, in 1934. For many years, ferries were the main way across the river, which has no bridges at this point. There are also two 20th century cathedrals, one Church of England, the other Roman Catholic. The Catholic Cathedral, one of the few in the world built with an underground car park, can be seen in the lower right foreground of the picture. The famous Lime Street station can be seen just right of the centre. Liverpool is a cosmopolitan city, and to the anger of both the Irish and the Welsh, it has been called the real capital of Ireland and the real capital of Wales because of the large number of Liverpudlians of Irish and Welsh descent. Today, it is well known for the wit and humour of its people and its high unemployment figures. There are plans to attract tourism to the area and to the northwest generally by converting areas of Dockland into leisure areas, parks and museums. The town that is going to die. You can take either the Kedawi route or the Clanevi road. Kedawi is the better road, but the Clanevi way is shorter. It's up to you, really. I'll tell you the short way anyway. Go about two miles up this road until you get to Clanevi. Just after you leave Clanevi, you'll see a turning on the left, the B4007. Keep going along here for about two miles or so, past the Tredawi mine on your left. Go down the hill into the town and you'll come to a roundabout. Turn left, past the post office and go on to the next junction. 
you'll see a church on the other side of the road. Bear right and carry on to the next fork in the road. Take the right fork and look out for a little road. It's a track, really, on the right. It's easy to miss it. Go a hundred yards or so up the track and look at the field to your left. That's the site for the reactor. Collector's Corner Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Collector's Corner. For this afternoon's programme we come to visit 16-year-old Adrian Shaw. We're in Adrian's room at the moment and we're completely surrounded by bottles. Yes, bottles. Big ones, small ones, blue ones, green ones. In fact, it's difficult to see the walls at all. There are so many bottles. How many bottles are there, Adrian? 1,429. 1,429. Have you counted them? Yeah, this morning. I thought you might ask me that question. And are they all different? Yeah. I keep my spares in a box in the shed. How did all this start? About three years ago, I was fishing in the river and I found a bottle. This one here. And I'd never seen one like it. So I took it home, cleaned it up and showed it to my granddad. He said all the bottles were like that when he was my age. I've never seen one like it. No, my granddad's nearly 70. It's an old beer bottle. Mm. Anyway, granddad said it might be worth a bit of money. So I took it along to this shop my mum knew, where she'd seen old bottles in the window. And how much was it worth? Well, the bloke in the shop offered me six quid for it. It's a pretty rare one, because it's got the name of the brewery on it, and it was only a small brewery. Weren't you tempted to sell it? No, not really. I told him I'd think about it. I saw one in a catalogue the other day. I could get 15 quid for it now, but I wouldn't sell it. Anyway, I like it. And where did you find all these other bottles? Not all in the river, surely? No, though rivers are good places to look, especially near bridges where people chuck them in and they get stuck in the mud. Where else, then? Rubbish dumps. Usually the ones out of town, you know, where they used to bury all the old rubbish. And how do you know where to find these dumps? A lot have been built on, haven't they? Some have, but not all. You can look at old maps in the library, or you can ask old people. They can often remember where people used to chuck rubbish. And, of course, it doesn't cost anything, does it? No. I've never spent a penny on a bottle. Though you can buy them in shops. A lot of people do. Do you ever sell a bottle? Oh, yeah. But only if I've already got one the same. You know, I sell one and keep the other. What do people keep in all these bottles? All kinds of things. Medicine. You find a lot of old medicine bottles. They're usually blue. But there are all sorts, really. Beer bottles, ink bottles, all shapes and sizes. Tell me about that green one over there. What was that used for? Oh, that was used... Sequences. Car wash. Brian was extremely proud of his car. It was his first new car after years of second-hand disasters, and he had saved long and hard to get it. He remembered the day three months previously when he had walked into the showroom to order it. The salesman had been helpful and friendly, and Brian had enjoyed every detail of the transaction. Having had a test drive, he had sat for over an hour poring over the list of options. Yes, he would have metallic paint. No, he wouldn't bother with an electric aerial or electric windows. Certainly not at a cost of £350. Yes, he would have the deluxe sheepskin seat covers and so on. When it was eventually delivered gleaming to his door, he had been almost afraid to drive it. That was three weeks ago, and the gleam had gradually become dulled by dust. It was the hottest summer in living memory. It was time for its first wash. Brian drove carefully to the automatic car wash at a nearby service station. He was sure that passers-by must be admiring his beautiful machine. He drove in, got his token and joined the queue. At last it was his turn, and he pushed the token into the slot and carefully positioned the car in the centre of the car wash. He felt a bit apprehensive when he looked at the huge green brushes, but he wound down his window again and firmly stabbed the start button. 
There was a loud whirring noise as the brushes descended and the spray began. Brian tapped his fingers in time with the song on his stereo FM radio. The radio? It was working. That meant the aerial was up. Brian turned to look. Too late. There was nothing he could do. Wait. Better close the window quickly. Brian grabbed at the winding handle in panic. There was a slight cracking noise, and Brian found himself staring down at the handle. It had broken off in his hand, with the window open. He felt the first fine spray on his face, and he had time for one last longing look at his sheepskin seat covers before the deluge of detergent and water hit him. Urban Legends The Hook A boy and girl were sitting in a parked car late one evening, listening to the radio. Over the radio came an announcement that a crazed killer with a hook in place of a hand had escaped from the local insane asylum. The girl got scared and begged the boy to take her home. He got mad and stepped on the gas and roared off. When they got to her house, he got out and went around to the other side of the car to let her out. There, on the door handle, was a bloody hook. The Vanishing Hitchhiker Well, this happened to one of my girlfriend's best friends and her father. They were driving along a country road on their way home from the cottage when they saw a young girl hitchhiking. She told the girl and her father that she just lived in the house about five miles up the road. She didn't say anything after that, but just turned to watch out the window. When the father saw the house, he drove up to it and turned around to tell the girl they had arrived. But she wasn't there. Both he and his daughter were really mystified and decided to knock on the door and tell the people what had happened. They told them that they had once had a daughter who answered the description of the girl they supposedly had picked up. But she had disappeared some years ago and had last been seen hitchhiking on this very road. Today would have been her birthday. The Mouse in the Bottle Two old ladies stopped at a restaurant to have lunch. They ordered their lunch and asked for two bottles of a well-known soft drink while they were waiting. The bottles were made of green glass, and they each poured themselves a glass. They were chatting away and drinking, and one of them finished the first glass and poured another. She noticed something in the bottom of the bottle, but couldn't make out what it was. She tried to get it out, and finally succeeded. It was a decomposed mouse. They both fainted and had to be revived. Anyway, they sued the soft drink company and got thousands of dollars. Prejudice Right, well, um, my name's uh, Don Crabtree, and I come from Headingley in Leeds. I'm, a, I'm an insurance salesman, I'm working for the Ribble Mutual Widows Benevolent Society, and I travel over far, 400 miles every week in my work, uh, which doesn't leave me much time for a hobby, but I do like, um, I do like a drop of real ale. Oh, hello, um, my name's Dora N. Twistle, and... Um, I'm from Liverpool, and uh, 
I work in a factory like and I've got three kids and a husband. Hello there, I'm uh, Angus McPherson from Glasgow, which is in Scotland, of course. Uh, Morag, my wife, and I have eight children, so it's quite a large family. And uh, I have a general medical practice in the town, so uh, I keep pretty busy. Uh, my name's Gwyneth Jones. Uh, I live in Gwent, which is South Wales. Uh, I'm a housewife with two children, um, and my husband's uh, a minor. My name's Wayne Roberts, and I come from Birmingham in the Midlands. I work in a car factory and I like to play football at weekends. I uh, got married last year and we got a little girl aged four months. We'd like to have a boy next time. Well, I work as an assistant matron at Budley Salterton Infirmary. That's what the locals call it. I live in Exeter, which is in Devon. Oh, my name is Jill Carpenter and I've got three children. There's not a lot of work in the area, so most of my cases are, well... Some of the lads from the farm with agricultural injuries, that sort of thing. Hello, my name's uh, Laurie Morrison, and I, uh, I'm from Whitley Bay, which is up near Newcastle in the northeast of, of England. I'm unemployed at the moment, but uh, me, uh, me hobby's playing football and, and watching it on the telly, like. My name's Tracy Sparrow, and I come from Hounslow in London. Um, I work in a shoe shop in Richmond High Street. Um, I never really go away on holiday because, well, I just think London's the greatest city in the world and I wouldn't want to leave it. Making your point. Jenny McPherson is the managing director of GB Electrics. She's talking to a marketing meeting. Now we come to the most important item on today's agenda, that's item 7, the GB Express copy maker. I think all of you have reports for the meeting, yes? Well, we'll hear them in a moment. I haven't seen them yet, and so I'll make my remarks as brief as possible. I'd just like to point out a few problems. Over the years, coffee consumption in Britain has been increasing rapidly and is now around the same level as tea consumption. That's the good news, if you're selling instant coffee. During the same period, coffee has become a weak, warm liquid with little flavour or taste. In other words, coffee has become more and more like English tea. You know the joke about our canteen here. How do you know which is coffee and which is tea? The tea comes in blue cups. <laughs> when we began selling filter machines, our initial sales were low. On the other hand, the profit per machine was high. And what is more, sales have doubled in almost every year since then. The British public are slowly beginning to develop a taste for real coffee, by which I mean filter coffee. Our new machine, or so I've heard, is a great improvement. Imported machines from Italy and Holland are beginning to sell well, and unless we make a positive move, we'll be too late. The public will identify espresso coffee with imported machines. After all, they are an Italian invention. From another point of view, we could say that a British manufacturer will not do well in this market, and that we might be safer to promote our filter machines, which of course are considerably cheaper. The last thing I want to say before hearing your reports is that I still have an open mind. It's up to this meeting to come to a conclusion either way. The Parkhurst Talkabout Good evening and welcome again to the Michael Parkhurst Talkabout. It is now some years since the government introduced the Sex Discrimination Act, which was intended to ensure equality of opportunity for men and women. We wondered whether the act had been successful, and our four guests tonight are discussing the general question of equality of opportunity. Bernard Blackburn, journalist and broadcaster. In my opinion, we shall never create real equality of opportunity by making laws about newspaper advertisements. You know, you have to advertise for a salesperson nowadays rather than a salesman or saleswoman. I'm not saying that these things are unimportant, but basically, by the time children get to four or five, they have already been conditioned into their social roles. It starts in the cradle. 
Girls in pink, boys in blue. I heard about an experiment a few years ago where they took a small baby and dressed it in blue. Then they asked several mothers to play with it. They bounced it up and down and tickled it and said things like, You're a rascal, a real little devil, and oh, what a big strong boy you are. And they laughed when it yelled and shouted. Well, then they dressed the same baby in pink and got another group to play with it. They cuddled it and said, Aren't you pretty? What a lovely little girl. As soon as it got noisy, they tried to hush it and calm it down. Now, that's where sexism begins. And that's long before we give the girls dolls and toy saucepans to play with and give the boys cars and guns. Hmm. Helen Grant, university lecturer. I feel there's a long way to go before we can talk about equality of opportunity. Men still expect their jobs to take priority. Even where both partners work, too many men still expect the woman to cook meals and do housework. I mean, go into a supermarket at lunchtime. It's full of working women giving up their lunch hour to do the family shopping. How many men would expect to do the same? They're probably spending the lunch hour laughing and joking about women. The same old tired jokes go on forever. Women drivers, mothers-in-law and sexy secretaries. Secretaries? That's another absurdity. Imagine an office where a man and a woman are doing similar jobs. She's called a secretary, he's called a trainee manager. Of course, this is how so many firms avoid obeying the law on equal pay by altering the job description. The media, as always, I'm afraid, is so much to blame. Magazines, TV, film and advertising portray women as sex objects, not people. Women are blackmailed into buying useless products because they might fear they're unattractive without them. Too many of us accept the stereotype and waste our time worrying and dieting to fit some imaginary male ideal. Mm, mm. Dr. Alice Lee, a general practitioner. Equality, yes. Well, I'm a doctor, so I suppose you could say that I have an interesting, rewarding and important job. However, I have experienced tremendous prejudice from male colleagues. And after all, while there are plenty of women doctors, most of the surgeons and top consultants are men. The argument's always the same in all spheres of activity, that women will leave the job to have babies. Of course, not all women want to have babies, so this is tremendously unjust. Personally, I did want children. I've got two, and I stopped work to have them. Children are always forgotten in the argument. I've always felt that it is a very narrow view of life to value a person purely in terms of job status. I believe we should remove the barriers against women at work, but I also do not see myself only as a working person, Dr. Lee. Being a mother is a very important social role, and we need to reassess our view of motherhood and to regard it as equally valid as any job. It is absurd to think a woman is more successful as a prime minister than as a mother. Of course, this is equally true for men. Couples who have swapped roles, where the mother has gone out to work and the father has stayed at home, will tell you that both jobs are equally important and even that being at home is more demanding emotionally and physically. Hmm. Rosemary Valentine, romantic novelist. Perhaps I come from a different generation. When I was a girl, things were quite different. I enjoy having doors open for me. I like it when men stand up as I enter a room and make sure that I'm seated before them. I feel that the romance has gone out of life today. I used to love getting dressed up for a party, having my hair done and so on. I never felt inferior, just different. I wouldn't want my husband to help me in the house. I'd feel strange if he did. I also can't worry about all this fuss about words. We're supposed to say chairperson rather than chairman. I don't dislike it, but I don't see it as terribly important. I think my husband is a typical example of a male chauvinist pig, but I like him that way.
Rules and Regulations 1. Charles Orson Well, of course, I started in Hollywood right in the middle of the Hayes office days. And, you know, we had to show them scripts before we started filming. I'm not sure how carefully they looked at them, but it was a good thing for us. You see, it's pretty expensive to film a five-minute scene which you later have to throw away because of one wrong word. It was much easier to discuss it beforehand. Sometimes it was pretty absurd. I remember a script in, oh, uh, 48 or 49, where the Hayes office sent it back and said, you can't use this, there are three dams, two hells, and one blast in this scene. We got back to them and said something like, it's essential to the story. So they say, okay, but you'll have to cut it down a bit. You can have two dams, one hell, and scrap the blast. I thought that was pretty silly. I mean, either it's wrong or it isn't. Mind you, some of the things they said were sensible. You weren't allowed to show how to pick a lock, and you weren't allowed to show how to kill yourself, for example. No, we often laughed at them. Censors are never popular, but the code gave us a discipline. I mean, some beautiful images came on to film because of it. You were forbidden to show something on screen, so you'd have to use a, an image instead. Butterflies whirling round or waves on a beach. You know, the kind of thing. Nowadays, it's all too direct, too obvious. Well, there's no mystery left in the cinema. I was against censorship all my life. But when I see some of the stuff little kids are watching... I think maybe it's gone too far in the other direction. I mean, y you have to draw the line somewhere. You really do. 2. Bourne Hall Julie is a new student at Wessex University. She's just arrived at her hall of residence, Bourne Hall. She's talking to Tricia, a second-year student. Hi, I'm Trisha Lambert. I think we're going to be neighbours. Oh, hello. I'm Julie Morgan. Yes, I suppose we are. Are you new here? Yes. I've just been looking at these regulations. I don't suppose it was worth bringing my cassette player. Oh, why not? Everybody's got one. Oh, I see. You've been reading the rules. Well, look, Julie, it's a matter of common sense. Nobody's going to stop you playing it. It's not like that. It's just that you mustn't stop other people working. No, I wouldn't want to do that. I won't play it late. You don't have to worry. All you've got to do is check with the others on this floor. Usually they won't mind a bit of music. But it's not allowed after 11. You're not supposed to play it late, of course. But I'm sure you'll find it's all right sometimes. 3. On the bus. Annette's on a bus. Oi, you can't stand there. Sorry? I said you mustn't stand there, love. You're in a driver's way. Go on, move back. I'm terribly sorry. I didn't realise. But there's no need to be rude about it, is there? Four. On the beach. Come on, Sam. Kick it over here. Come on. Oi, you two lads. Stop that. Stop what? Stop kicking that ball around. It's against the regulations. Eh? What regulations? Can't you read, son? No ball games on the promenade. It's not allowed, see? Why not? We're not doing any harm. It's a regulation, that's why. You can play football on the beach, that's all right. Well, there's no room on the beach. Well, you can't play here. Go on, get a move on. Alas. Hello? Hello, is anybody there? Oh, Lord, my head's splitting. Oh, Mary, there you are. Bring me some coffee. Some black coffee. Oh, you should be in bed, ma'am. That's what the doctor said he did. Bed? 
How can I sleep with all this going on? Bring the coffee, Mary. Ah, this is a surprise. We haven't seen you at breakfast for years. What's happened? Summer sale at the off-license? That's enough. Just like your father, you know. Just like him. But a bit brighter, eh? Just a bit brighter. I sometimes think you're worse. You're not like me. Not at all like me. Thank goodness for that. Hello. Nice to see you up so early. Good morning. Has anybody seen my husband yet? Why? Has he left you? Very funny. No, I just thought he'd be here. He said he was going straight down to breakfast. Perhaps he's run away. Wouldn't be the first time for you, would it? What do you mean? Come on, what are you trying to say exactly? Yes, leave her alone. There's no reason to start on her. Hello, everybody. What's all the fuss about, eh? It's nothing, darling. Just your delightful brother, as usual. Just my sense of humour, that's all. I thought I told you to leave her alone. Do you often have to say that to people? Why, What's I'll... going on here? Now we have breakfast in peace for once. Sit down, both of you. I won't have squabbling in the house. Well, when I was a lad, I'd done two or three hours' work before breakfast. I didn't get where I am today by squabbling. Where's my scrambled eggs? I've got a meeting at nine o'clock. A meeting? You didn't tell me about a... meeting. He's been having private meetings for years. What's her name? Leave it out. I haven't got the time or the patience. I suppose that layabout isn't up yet. That's no way to talk about him. After all, he is your... Good morning, everyone. Hello, darling. I'm sorry I'm a little late. I couldn't find my eyeliner. Hello, darling. You look splendid. <laughs> By the way, I might be late tonight. Uh, I've got to see somebody. That's all right, my sweet. Uh, milk, dear? Oh, you must let me introduce you to my hairdresser, dear. You've been neglecting yourself since... Since, well, you know. <laughs> oh, I am sorry. I did promise not to mention it again. Come on, love. It's nearly a year now. It was his own bloody fault, anyway. There's no need, you oaf. Help, everybody. Come quickly. She's in the pool. The swimming pool. I think... I think she's dead. Relay. This is Craig Walton of Southern Radio Sport here at the Intercity Athletics Championship at Wembley Stadium. I've just heard that they're ready to begin the draw for one of the week's most popular events, the men's 4x100 metre relay. So we're going over to the committee rooms. Testing, one, two, testing, one, two. Can you hear me? Right. We are going to begin the draw. The first four teams out of the hat will be in the first heat. And they are... South London on the inside track. Brighton. Bristol. And York on the outside. In the second heat... Testing. One, two... I think there's something wrong with this microphone. One, two... Oh, it's, it's, it's OK. <clears throat> We have Exeter on the inside, Newcastle, Dover, and Swansea. And in the third heat, we shall have Leeds on the inside, Liverpool. Quiet, please. Quiet! And... Oh, switch. Oh, it's on again. Sorry about that. One, two. Liverpool... Cambridge and Nottingham and in the fourth heat one two one two the teams will be Oxford on the inside Glasgow Birmingham and finally Manchester that completes the draw for the one two testing one two 
Now listen to the heats. One. They're lining up now for the first heat. They're ready. On your marks. Set. They're off to a flying start. Waters from South London's taking the lead as they round the bend. Then Gates, Tankard, Bell, Sings taking the baton. Minsters in hot pursuit for York. Then the Bristol boy as they come up to the third stage. And it's Marley for London really moving there and riding. These two are well ahead into the fourth stage. Minder stumbling and the York boy is moving through. Yes, it's Roundtree in front. Then Minder straining to catch him. And that's it. Roundtree of York is first. Minder from South London second. Then Bristol with Brighton at the rear. If you've just joined us, we're at the start of the second heat in the men's 4 by 100 meters relay. In many ways, this is the weakest heat with none of the favorites in it. They're on the blocks, Exeter in the orange on the inside, then Terry from Newcastle, Castle from Dover, and Llewellyn from Swansea in the green vest. On your marks, set. Oh, something was wrong with the start there. They're going back to the blocks. Very nerve-wracking when that happens. On your marks. Set. Oh, and Castle surging into the lead, going like a rocket. The other three bunched together. And at the baton, it's still Dover. Nothing to choose between the others as they come to the second change. And it's Dover. Well in front in the yellow. More of Exeter making a challenge. Is he moving? Round to the last change. And Ferry's blocking Penburn of Exeter. Penburn can't get through. What is Ferry doing? And at the tape, it's Ferry of Dover from Penburn, Exeter, and D.F. Jones of Swansea. And North limping home for Newcastle. Of course, he injured his foot in the hurdles. But wait. Ferry has been disqualified for pushing. What a pity for Dover. After a great race. Three. Well, many would say that this was the strongest heat, perhaps the one most likely to produce the champion team. Cambridge must be the outsiders here with Liverpool, the clear favourites. Yet you can't write off teams like Leeds and Nottingham, who were so narrowly beaten last year. A sharp of Liverpool is just looking at his shoes. No trouble, I hope, for the Jamaican lad who's run so brilliantly for Liverpool. No, no, they're getting ready. On your marks. Set. And Sharp explodes into the lead with Clough just behind him and Lomax pounds ahead of Jones. But they're all keeping together at the baton and Nottingham takes the lead after a clumsy change by Liverpool. Now falling back into third place behind Leeds as they come up for the next change. That was better for Liverpool. Harrison is forging ahead, but Lawrence is keeping up with Nottingham. Uh, Chatterley takes the baton from Lawrence just ahead of Lenton, but these two are neck and neck and going like the wind. And at the tape, it's a photo finish, but I think Liverpool just ahead there. Yes, that's confirmed. And Liverpool have set a new British record of 38.12 seconds. In fact, the first three have all bested the previous record. Four. Lining up for the final heat. On your marks, set. It's Bob Bruce in the lead from Vic Aston and Billy Kramer. What an athlete Bruce is, marvellous runner. And Macbeth's going to take himself into a good lead now for Glasgow, then Birmingham, then Manchester, with Oxford trailing as we come into the bend, and Campbell's off to a bad start. Look at Thompson. He's making a strong challenge, going past them all for Oxford. He's ahead of Glasgow at the change, and Hartley just has to run home. Yes, they can't catch him now. He's over the line with McLeish taking a good runners-up place for Glasgow. A great run from Thompson there. Now listen to the semi-finals. One. There's a tremendous atmosphere here at Wembley as we wait for the first semi-final in the men's 4x100 metre relay. The first runners are getting prepared, and who can predict the result? York are the surprise semi-finalists, and a lot of people are shouting for them. On the other hand, Nottingham must be the logical choice, just beaten by Liverpool in that record-breaking third heat. Then again, Glasgow seemed unlucky in the fourth heat. They're on the blocks. On your marks. Set. 
It's Clough into an early lead in the white and red for Nottingham with Bruce and Gates fighting for second place. Coming up to the change and Forrest keeps the lead for Nottingham running beautifully. Then Minster in the all-white strip for York. Macbeth into the second change. And, oh, Campbell's chasing Lawrence of Nottingham. It's anybody's race. York's just behind as they go for the change. But Chatterley has dropped the baton. Chatterley has dropped. York are well ahead and Glasgow run into second place. What a turn up for the book. York are in the final for the first time and Chatterley is on the ground utterly dejected. But uh, over now to the javelin. Two. Perhaps the second semi-final is a little more predictable. We have four good teams, but Liverpool must be unbeatable. That's Sharp talking to Waters, both men, of course, in the Olympic team, but that doesn't mean they won't be doing their best to beat each other today. They're getting ready. Oxford in dark blue, Liverpool red, South London white, and Swansea green. We're ready. On your marks. Set. And it's sharp. Hornby in the blue, then Swansea in green with Waters trailing for South London. They're coming. They're into the change. Beautifully taken for Liverpool by McCartney. And Cole of Oxford fighting Singh for second position. Bryn Jones lagging for Swansea. It's a race for second place, surely now, as Harrison races ahead. He's nearly 20 metres in front now as he comes up to pass the baton to Lenton. Oh, he's well ahead. Maybe this could be a record breaker again. Lenton's across the line. Then Harley for Oxford, just a touch in front of Minder for London. Let's get the time. 38.09 seconds. Liverpool have just beaten their new record. Now listen to the final. Well, after yesterday's semi-final, there can't be much doubt about who's favourite for today's 4 by 100 metre relay. Liverpool are on top form and the less experienced teams from York, Oxford and Glasgow must realise the fight is for the second place. But no race can be a 100% foregone conclusion as we line up for the final. Sharp, as usual, takes the start for Liverpool. Oxford have changed the running order with Thompson opening and Hornby taking the third stage. On your marks. Set. Gates for York, first off the line, but Sharp's with him. Thompson passes Bruce. They run for the changeover, smoothly taken. They're all together, not much to choose between them. McCartney edges to the front, but Cole's going like a steam engine. They're into the second change, and it's got to be Liverpool. Harrison pulls away from Hornby. Riding and Campbell are both close, very close. The third... And Lenton, Lenton is, Lenton is down, he's down, and Oxford fighting to catch York desperately. Lenton's up, but at the line is Oxford. Oxford by a hair's breadth from Roundtree of York. Ghost plane crash. We came alongside and uh, looked into the cockpit, hoping to see or wondering whether we were going to see a crew or a hijack in progress or whatever. And we looked in, and on the first pass, we weren't sure. Uh, John thought that he saw somebody in the front cockpit. Second time we came round, we managed to stabilize uh, with the aeroplane in a close formation position. And uh, we looked in and were able to see that there was nobody sitting at the controls. In many ways, it was uh, a good thing that they were probably dead or unconscious at that time. In that if there'd been somebody in the rear waving at us, I mean, there was nothing we could do uh, to resolve the problem. So it, it made things a bit easier for us, if, if you understand what I mean. Belief, doubt and certainty. Roy Clark is an investigator for an insurance company. He's investigating a fire at a small warehouse. The contents were insured for half a million pounds. He's talking to Dave Grimes, the owner. Look, I can't see what you're here for. I filled out all the forms, right? When do I get my money? It's not quite that simple, Mr. Grimes. We have to be absolutely sure of every detail before we pay you. It's all on the form, isn't it? Yes, well, uh... Where did the fire start? Well, how should I know? It was three o'clock in the morning. On the form, you've put the reception area down. Well, that's what the fire brigade thought. I've got no idea. But you put it on the form. They said it must have started there. Look, it destroyed half a million quid's worth of stuff. There's some dispute about that figure. I'll have to see invoices and delivery notes for it, I'm afraid. Are you calling me a liar? No, no, I don't doubt your word for a moment, Mr. Grimes. Oh, all right, then. I'm sorry, but I'm bound to ask you the next question. And please believe me that I'm not disputing your statement. 
But is it true that business has been very bad recently? Who said that? That's nonsense. As a matter of fact, there was a newspaper report a few weeks ago. It said that there will be 20 redundancies here. Oh, yeah. Well, we're reorganizing. I see. No doubt the newspaper was exaggerating. That's right. It's just that my manager has raised some questions about your business. You must understand that it's hard for us to see... to see how you could possibly sell half a million pounds worth of electric coffee stirrers. We just can't believe that anybody would buy them. Are you accusing me of arson? Saying, I set light to the place myself? I didn't say that. It's just, uh, slightly suspicious that... Uh... Harry. In tonight's edition of Reflections, we are going to look at the problems of long-term prisoners. We took our cameras into several prisons, and our first interview is with a man we shall call Harry, although that is not his real name. He spoke to Chloe West about his career in crime. Harry, you're serving a five-year sentence for robbery with violence. That's right. Perhaps you could begin by telling us about your early life. Yeah. Well, I grew up in South London. I was on my own a lot. See, my, my mother used to work down the fish market, and my dad, well, he ran off when I was just a nipper. Did you have any friends? Oh, yeah. All the kids from our street used to meet up at the coffee bar. There was one at the end of the road. We didn't have much money, so we used to hang around there all day. We never used to go to the cinema or dancing or anything like that. We couldn't afford it. What did you used to do there? Oh, we just sat around listening to the jukebox. Nothing special. When did you start getting into trouble? I suppose uh, I was 14. Something like that. My friends used to go shoplifting at Woolies, Woolworths. And one day, we were caught. I ended up in Borstal. You mean they sent you to Borstal for... for shoplifting? Well, yeah. After the fourth time. And for beating up old ladies. You used to beat up old ladies? Well, only when I was trying to rob them. You beat them up and then rob them? Yeah. I used to do that. Perhaps you'd tell me about your life in prison. Well, I suppose the worst thing is being shut up all the time. Yeah. And I can't stand getting up at 5.30 either. I just can't get used to that, even though I've been here more than three years. You see, before I came here, I liked staying in bed all morning. I was on night work, you see. Night work? Hmm. Burglary, mostly. <laughs> I caught you there. I can't get used to going to bed at eight, either. Harry, if you don't mind me saying so, a lot of viewers will think of you as an enemy of society. Well, that's fair enough. But I've admitted doing a lot of things. I spent a lot of time thinking. I could keep on stealing things, but I'd end up spending half my life behind bars. I'm going straight this time, don't you worry. What do you intend doing when you get out? I'm very fond of working on motorbikes. I've been studying while I've been inside, and I'm hoping to qualify as a mechanic. Do you think you'll be able to get a job? That's a bit of a problem. People are scared of employing someone with a record like mine. You know, in case they begin stealing again. How will you get round that? I'm planning on working for my brother. He's got a motorbike shop. So, you plan to work for your brother? That's right. I tell you, I won't be back... I'm not going to risk wasting another five years. Well, I wish you luck, Harry. Thanks. Medical advice. That was the latest record from Computer Space Travel. 11 o'clock on Tuesday, 17th September, here on the Timothy Old Show on Radio Wessex 206 metres medium wave. And it's time for our medical advice spot. Today's guest is Dr Guy Lines from the Common Cold Research Unit. Dr Lines, could you briefly describe your work? Yes, Tim. We ask volunteers to stay with us at the research centre for two weeks. And we give them a cold. <laughs> you give them a cold? That's correct. Actually, we give half of them a cold. That is, we infect them with a solution of cold germs. Oh. 
and the other half are given clear, plain water. They are a control group. Our researchers don't know which volunteers have been infected. How do you get volunteers? By word of mouth. It's like a holiday hotel, really. And, of course, only half are infected. Uh -huh. We can then study the effect of different cold treatments. So, have you found a cure yet? Not yet, I'm afraid. Although I'd like to get rid of a few old wives' tales. You get a cold from germs, not from wet feet or cold air or sitting in a draught. What advice would you give to cold sufferers, then? The oldest of all. If you treat a cold, it takes about a week to get over it. Uh -huh. If you don't treat it, then it takes about a week to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> what about aspirin or hot whiskey and lemon? Of course, aspirin or a drink of spirits helps the symptoms. It makes the sufferer feel better especially if they just go to bed and wait. It doesn't cure it, though. What about your research? We're finding good results from vitamins. Large doses of vitamin C, and I mean five or six grams a day, do seem to help some people if taken at the very first sign of a cold. Mm -hmm. Once it's started, though, it seems much less successful. Vitamins A and B6 also seem to help, but we have a lot more research to do. Uh -huh. yeah. Interfere on does give good results, but of course it's wildly expensive and we can't really waste the limited supplies we have on coal research. Most of it is being used for cancer research at the moment. Interferon? Yes, I'm sure you've heard of it. <sighs> Wasn't there a program about it on TV recently? There was. <sighs> What's your final advice then? Basically, go home, <laughs> take plenty of liquid, vitamin C certainly won't do you any harm and it may help. Aspirin will make you feel better, but the best advice I can give is rest. Plenty of rest. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lies. Uh, we'll be coming back to you after our next record. It's Daisy Barton singing, You Broke My Heart. Artificial Intelligence Here is an example of Eliza in operation. Men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here? He says I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear you're depressed. It's true. I am unhappy. Do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? Youth Culture 1. Introduction In this series of lectures, we shall be examining British society since 1945. Our first topic is youth culture. Now, what exactly do we mean by youth culture? In 1950, a teenager was simply someone aged between 13 and 19. By 1980, the word teenager had developed a much wider and more complex meaning. This was probably because of a whole series of industries which grew up during the 1950s, which were specifically directed at the teenage market. Why should this have happened? The main reason was that teenagers were a section of the community with surplus money spending money. At that time, people left school at 15 or 16, but didn't usually marry until their early 20s. More often than not, they lived at home in the meantime. Their parents had little spare money. Almost every penny was accounted for, since they were buying a house, bringing up a family, and perhaps saving for a first car or even a first holiday abroad. Because few parents asked their children for realistic sums of money for food and lodging, the kids had money to spend. Consequently, industry wasted no time in finding them something to spend it on. We shall go on to look at some of the resulting changes in existing industries and also at some of the new industries which sprang up. 2. Cinema One of the first changes was in the cinema. During the 1930s, the average person saw two films a week. By 1960, this had been reduced to 12 films a year, and the current figure is less than half of that. The cause of the cinema's decline is obvious. Audiences fell as a result of the increase in television ownership. 
In fact, a similar increase was happening in other countries for two reasons. First, the general world economic recovery from the war. The second reason was that technology was making mass production possible and therefore sets were becoming cheaper. The effect of this was that the cinema lost its family audience. Because families were smaller and because they often lived in different areas from grandparents, the cinema had become an expensive night out. There were no free babysitters, i.e. grandparents. Of course, many cinemas closed, and the ones which survived were the ones in the town centres. Therefore, cinemas became more expensive to get to, and in consequence, audience numbers declined even more. The end result was a cinema aimed at the youth market, 16 to 25. This meant different kinds of films, and in the end, an even greater loss of the family audience. 3. Fashion Another area of change was fashion. Styles have always changed, but the change has usually been slow. A man's suit of 1925 would not have looked out of place in 1950, or in 1985, because they were made of natural materials, such as wool, silk, or leather. Clothes had been an expensive item for the family of the 1920s or 1930s, and high fashion was positively undesirable. Due mainly to changes in technology, clothes today are much cheaper. That is, they cost a much smaller percentage of our income. Man-made fibres and mass production are the basic causes of these reductions in real price. The first consequence was that people could afford to buy more clothes more often because they didn't have to wait until clothes were almost worn out before replacing them. Man-made fibres are hard-wearing and long-lasting, as well as cheap. The clothing industry did not want to lose sales, so the idea of fashion was promoted more heavily, especially to the youth market. One result of a national TV network was that new fashions in clothes, dance or music spread rapidly throughout the country, and this led to even more rapid changes in fashions and styles. In contrast to the man's suit of 1925, which would look normal today, Look at the fashions of 1956. 4. Pop music Perhaps the classic example of youth culture is pop music. There has always been music which is popular, but until 1950 or so, popular music meant the music of the working classes. Since 1955 or thereabouts, we have had pop music which is classless. A musician might tell us that the causes of pop culture are complex. He might say modern pop music is the result of a mixing, a, a blending of black American rhythm and blues with white American country and western music. We are interested in the effects of pop music, and no account of its origins can explain its worldwide popularity. This is almost certainly due, once again, to changes in technology. I would say that pop music as we know it is a direct consequence of the invention of the transistor. Uh, the transistor gave teenagers their own source of music, which was cheap and portable. That is to say, the transistor radio. As a result, teenagers were freed from the family radio, broadcasting bland music for a family audience. A demand was created for specifically teenage music, and, as usual, industry responded. At the same time, the invention of the 45 RPM vinyl record, which was almost unbreakable, led to greatly increased record sales. 5. Other Entertainments The new youth audience were too young to go to the traditional British pub because of British drinking laws which forbid the sale of alcohol to under-18s. In the United States, the drinking age was 21. This was a result of the Prohibition era between 1919 and 1933, when alcohol was totally forbidden. So again, there was a market, kids looking for somewhere to meet, and again there was a response. Coffee bars and milk bars began to open all over the country in the 1950s on account of this demand. Like pop music, an American model forms the basis. The pubs were left to the older males, the tea shops to the older females. Another effect 
A side effect of this Americanization was increased consumption of coffee. In 1945, tea was the normal British drink. By 1965, tea and coffee consumption was almost equal. 6. Summing up. So, the main areas we shall look at are the cinema next week, fashion the week after, pop music the week after that, and finally other entertainment in the last lecture in the series. There are some other manifestations of youth culture. Most of them a consequence of industry's response to a group with surplus money. I shall just mention a few of them. Motor scooters became popular here, as British kids, unlike their American contemporaries, could not afford cars. The scooter was not really suitable for Britain, on account of our weather and the resulting slippery roads. Thousands were sold. Another reason being that you could ride a scooter at 16, a year before you could apply for a car license. A huge cosmetics industry grew up, with massive advertising to make girls buy cosmetics which became very cheap. Why? As usual, the price resulted from new technology and synthetic ingredients. Magazines directed at the youth market were published in large numbers too. The same forces as ever were at work on this, the first TV generation. Because of their spending power, the concept of teenager, in inverted commas, was developed. However, in the 1950s, their spending power was still controlled by traditional industries. In the 1960s, things changed. But that's the subject of another lecture. Strong language. Oi, you! I was waiting to back into that space. Were you? Bad luck, mate. Uh, but, but I was indicating. I've been here for ages. Well, you were too slow, weren't you? Look, I'm not letting you get away with this. You'd better move, or else. Or else what? Or, or else I'll... Clear off, chum. I haven't got time. Yeah, you'd better watch it. Leave it, mate. Don't be so stupid. Just watch it, or I'll... Will you? You and whose army? Right. Come on, then. I'll give you one. Is that a threat or a promise, darling? Look, I'm off. I haven't got all day. Come back here. I'll... I'll... Excuse me. Miss. Over here. Miss. Yeah. I wonder if you'll be kind enough to get me a size 18 in this. If it's not too much trouble, that is. 18? We don't do extra large, love. Sorry. You want the outsize department. Well, what have you got in size 18? Eh? I thought I told you. We don't do extra large in anything. All right, but there's no need to be so unpleasant, you know. I say, I'm talking to you. I said... Oh? I am sorry, madam. I didn't want to upset madam, did I, madam? I was listening to madam, madam. And another thing. I'm going to ring your mother and tell her to stop interfering. Look, she's only trying to be helpful. Helpful? She phones every day to see if you've had enough to eat. I mean, for goodness sake. We have been married three years. Anyway, I'll tell her next time. Don't you dare ring her. Look, Martin. I'll do what the hell I like, OK? I'll never forgive you if you upset her. She, she worries, that's all. Upset her? What about me? I'm just going to tell her, very politely, to mind her own business. You... you dare? You'd better not try and stop me, either. I've had enough. I warn you. You phone her, and that's it. That's it. That's it. What the hell do you mean, that's it? I, I tell you, I'll leave if you do. Leave? Run home to Mummy. Don't threaten me, Martin. I couldn't care less what you do. You... you... you...
Hello, hello. Where's the fire? Sorry, I don't understand. You seem to be in a bit of a hurry, sir. I wondered if there was an emergency of some kind. No, no, no emergency. In that case, I'd better see your licence. You have got a licence, I suppose? Yes. What do you mean? Oh, it's just the way you were driving. I wondered if you'd passed your test, that's all. Very funny. Here it is. Right. David Humphreys. Mm -hmm. What's your date of birth, David? 9th of the 7th, 57. That's right. OK, Dave, get out of the car. What? Come on, Davey. I think we'll just take a breath test, eh? Look here, officer. I have not been drinking. I'm sure you haven't, Dave. But the test will settle that, won't it? I don't like your attitude, constable. I mean, all I was doing... Precautions. Come in, Tango Alpha Charlie. Do you read me? Over. We read you loud and clear. Over. What is your altitude? Over. We're holding steady at 4,000. Repeat, 4,000 feet. I can hear you, but I can't see you yet. Over. Please check on ground conditions. Over. There's a slight breeze down here. Nothing to worry about, though. It's only about four or five knots blowing south-southwest. You'll pick it up as soon as we light the smoke flare. Look out for the telephone line to the north of the field. Also, take care not to get near the sports pavilion. Over. The sports pavilion? Over. Yes, there's a telephone line running from the northeast corner to the north of the field. I reckon they should avoid that whole sector, just in case. Over. Right. We're going to turn in for our approach. Over. Please give checklist. Over. Right. We throttle back the engine and slow down. Once the door is open, I shall count down and cut the engine right back as they jump to avoid any turbulence. Over. I'm going to light the flare. Over. Watch you don't burn your fingers this time. <laughs> Over. Very funny. Over. I can see it. OK. Door open. Counting five, four, three, two, one, one out, two out, all out, over. I can see them. One, two, three, all shoots open. Here they come. Advice and suggestions. Scene 1. Ralph's house in London. Yes, boss. Have you seen this? In the morning paper? Let me see. Semi-literate. Half-wit. Least intelligent. I don't think you like the film, boss. It's Anderson again. I'm going down there to see him. Um, should I come with you, boss? What? Yes. Get the car. If I were you, I'd punch him on the nose, boss. That's what I'm going to do. You want to really show him this time? Well, let's go then. Uh, boss, don't you think we'd better tell Sam first? Huh? Yeah, perhaps we should. Get him on the phone. Scene two. Sam is Ralph's manager. Samuel Compton. Sam, it's me. Ralph. Oh, hi, Ralph. Uh, did you see the paper? Yes. I'm going down to see Anderson now. What? No, you'd better not, Ralph. Leave it. Did you see what he called me? Semi-literate? He's a critic, Ralph. That's not criticism. It's... it's libel. He's not going to get away with it. All right, Ralph. Calm down. Perhaps you ought to talk to a lawyer. A lawyer? Hmm. Uh, maybe you could sue him. I'll sue him for every penny he's got. Yes, well, why don't you just phone a lawyer? Go and have a talk about it. Scene three. Mrs. Spencer is Ralph's lawyer. Mr. James, do come in. Take a seat. Did Sam speak to you? Yes. Mr. Compton showed me the review. I want to sue. 
I would strongly advise you to think it over most carefully, Mr. James. I've thought it over already. The best thing you can do is to forget all about it. Look, you're my lawyer, aren't you? Sue him. I don't think we should, Mr. James. The review was in one newspaper. Not a popular one, either. Very few people will have read it. Probably few of your fans read the more serious papers, if you don't mind me saying so. If you sue, there'll be a lot of publicity. Bad publicity. You know the saying, mud sticks. But it's Anderson again. Do you remember what he wrote about my marriage last year? But you may remember that his report was true, Mr. James. Really, I suggest you forget it. You mean, I shouldn't sue? Exactly. Hmm. Well, I'll just go down there and have a little talk with him. I would recommend you not to do that, Mr. James. Really, my advice is to forget it. The Importance of Being Earnest Oscar Wilde's comedy, The Importance of Being Earnest, was first performed in 1895, and since then it has become the most performed play in the English theatre. They say that every Englishman is, or wants to be, an actor, and amateur dramatics are certainly a popular pastime. Local groups from churches, schools and clubs perform plays in small halls all over the country, and this is their favourite play. On any Friday or Saturday night in the winter months, it is being performed somewhere in the country. In this scene, Jack Worthing is being interviewed by his prospective mother-in-law, the formidable Lady Bracknell, for the first time. You can take a seat, Mr. Worthing. Thank you, Lady Bracknell. I prefer standing. I feel bound to tell you that you are not down on my list of eligible young men. Although I have the same list as the dear Duchess of Bolton has, we work together, in fact. However, I am quite ready to enter your name, should your answers be what a really affectionate mother requires. Do you smoke? Well, yes. I must admit I smoke. I'm glad to hear it. A man should always have an occupation of some kind. There are far too many idle men in London as it is. How old are you? Twenty-nine. A very good age to be married at. I have always been of the opinion that a man who desires to get married should know either everything or nothing. Which do you know? I know nothing, Lady Bracknell. I am pleased to hear it. I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it, and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England, at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. What is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investments? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected of one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it. About 1,500 acres, I believe. But I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people who make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. You have a town house, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. Well, I own a house in Belgrave Square, but it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back whenever I like, at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She is a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number in Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. Do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I am afraid I really have none. I am a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us. Or come in the evening, at any rate. Now to minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. 
Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I am afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... well, I was found. Found? The late Mr. Thomas Cardew, an old gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. Where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, Lady Bracknell. I was in a handbag, a somewhat large black leather handbag with handles to it. An ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or Thomas Cardew come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes. The Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I feel somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As for the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion has probably, indeed, been used for that purpose before now, but it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognised position in good society. May I ask you, then, what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolen's happiness. I would strongly advise you, Mr Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible, and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. Well, I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment. It is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bracknell. Me, sir? What is it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel... Good morning, Mr. Worthing. Away from it all. I've thought about it for many, many years. I've wanted to set up my own place where goddamn people like Freud aren't worth a hill of beans, where there ain't no rules, and where people don't give a damn about doing an honest day's work. I'll work like hell and build a place for myself and my grandchildren. And then I'll die a happy man. That's my dream. And now it looks like it may come true. I had been to Pitcairn first, and hell, you couldn't wish for a nicer place. The people are just like Virginians were 50 years ago when I was growing up. They were so happy and kind and pleased to see me and when I said I was figuring on living near them, they just near about flipped they were so happy. We took off for Henderson. God, was it stormer. All the rest of the fellas on the boat got sick, but not me. I was that screwed up inside with excitement that I didn't feel a thing. It took a couple of days sailing, and then we got there one afternoon. <laughs> It was just what I wanted. Flat as a pancake. Good beach. Landing place. Jungle thick as hell, mind you. But I figure I can clear that. And the weather's about as perfect as you can get. Seventy every day. A little rain once in a while. Just a great place for old smiley Ratcliffe to come and settle down. So that's what I'm figuring to do. You, the jury. 
Cross-examination by the prosecution. Lady Wyatt, would you describe yourself as an intelligent woman? I would never describe myself as anything. I'm not stupid. Do you not think it was stupid to put that scarf in your bag and walk away without paying? I intended to pay. There was nobody to pay. You couldn't have looked very hard, could you? Look, I've told you, I had an appointment, I was in a hurry. Surely not in such a hurry that you couldn't find someone to pay. Surely you could have spent a few minutes. Surely your friend would have waited. I don't like keeping people waiting. I'm never late. Couldn't you simply have put the scarf back and collected and paid for it later? I suppose so. I just didn't think. I intended to pay for it later. But you didn't pay for it, did you? I've told you ten times already. I simply forgot. <sighs> Every shoplifter says that, Lady Wyatt. I am not a shoplifter. Hmm. <clears throat> now, um, these pills... How long have you been taking them? Four or five years. They calm me down. And in those four or five years, have you ever suffered from loss of memory or forgetfulness? Not that I know of. And have you walked into shops, taken things, put them in your bag and walked away without making any effort to pay? No! No, no! But you did on this occasion. You took a scarf, put it in your bag and made no offer to pay. That is theft, common theft. How if we accepted your claim that you simply forgot, then every Tom, Dick and Harry would be walking in and out of shops taking whatever caught their eye. No, 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 Lady Wyatt, I forgot is no excuse at all. I maintain that you intended to steal. I believe many people do that just for kicks. It gives them a, a thrill. That's not true. But it is true, Lady Wyatt. No further questions, Your Honour. Cross-examination of the defence. Lady Wyatt, you're a very wealthy woman, aren't you? Wealthy? Yes. I don't know about very. But you don't need to work? No. How often do you go shopping at halls? I don't know exactly. I suppose once or twice a week. So in a year you would probably spend hundreds of pounds there? Yes. So there is no reason why you should want to steal anything? A scarf worth ten pounds, maybe. Of course not. It's quite ridiculous. Have you ever been in trouble with the police before? No, never. Not even a traffic offence? No. And you're a well-known figure in the community? I suppose so. I do a lot of work for charity. And you say that you just forgot to pay? Yes. Well, that's easy enough to do. I've done it myself. And I imagine many people in this court have. And of course... You would have returned to pay as soon as you realised. Yes. I would have realised when I got home. Thank you, Lady Wyatt. No further questions, Your Honour. Where's Mr Grayson? Oh, excuse me. Is this Grayson Worldwide Trading Limited? Who are you? I'm Susie Miller, from the A1 Secretarial Agency. Is this Mr. Grayson? Yeah, yeah. What kept you? I've been waiting. You only phoned 20 minutes ago. What exactly would you like me to do? Uh, just wait here and uh, answer the phone, that's all. I'll be back later. But what shall I say? Just take a message, that's all. Shall I um, tidy up or anything? No, just a phone, OK? See you later. Oh, hold on. Who are you? I'm Grayson. Tim Grayson. See you. Message 1, 1042. Grayson Worldwide Trading Limited. Uh, may I speak to Mr. Grayson, please? I'm afraid Mr. Grayson's out. Can I take a message? Oh, dear. When are you expecting him back? Um, I'm not sure. Who's calling? It's Mr. Jackson from the Midland Bank. Can you ask him to call me? Certainly, Mr. Jackson. Goodbye. Goodbye. Message 2, 1056. Grayson. Grayson. Is that you? I'm afraid Mr. Grayson's not here at the moment. Who's calling? It's... Uh, tell him it's Mr. Smith. Mr. John Smith, you'll know who I am. Can I speak to him now? I told you he wasn't in, Mr. Smith. Come on, he'll speak to me. I'm sure he would, but he really is out. Who are you? I'm his secretary. 
Is there any message? Secretary. Grayson with a secretary. Don't make me laugh, sweetheart. Look, do you want to leave a message or not? Yeah. Just say, can you meet John Smith at 8.30? The usual place. Say it's important. Very important. Say, say, I want to know whether he's got the papers. Have you got that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Goodbye. Message 3, 11.02. Grayson, Worldwide Trading. Hello. Hello, I'm phoning about my order. Could I have your name, please? Oh, yes, it's uh, Brown. Mrs. Brown from Leeds. I'm afraid... Uh, I'm afraid the person who deals with orders isn't here. Can I take a message? Oh, dear. I've tried to phone several times, and this is the first time I've had a reply. It's about the order, you see. What order was that, Mrs. Brown? The complete set of kitchen knives. Well, I saw the advert in the paper, and I sent my cheque months ago. Well, the order's never arrived, you see. Well, could I... Could I take your number? Someone can phone you back. Well, I'm not on the phone. You see, I'm using a neighbour's phone. Perhaps you could phone her, if that's all right. I'm getting worried, you see. I, I've written twice, too. Shall I take your number? Oh, oh yes, yes. It's... Leeds 178432. Thank you. I'll pass on the message. Yes, uh, yes. They were expensive, you see. Uh, yes. Uh, goodbye, then. Message 4, 1119. Grayson, Worldwide Trading. Where's Grayson? Mr. Grayson's not here. Can I tell you... Are you sure? Yes. Who's calling? My name's Evans. Evans Printing Company. Er, uh, would you like to leave a message? Yes. Where's my money? He owes me £2,700 and he'd better pay up soon. I see. Anything else? Yes. What's he done with all the letters I've sent him? I've written every bloody week. You tell him. I'm just a temporary secretary here. Yes. Well, sorry, love. It's not your fault. Tell him he'd better phone me back, all right? I'll be waiting. Goodbye. Message 5, 11.26. Grayson, Worldwide Trading. I'd like to speak to Tim Grayson, please. I'm afraid he's out at the moment. Who am I speaking to? I'm... I'm a temporary secretary. Is that what he calls you? Sorry? I don't know what you're talking about. Can I take a message? Yes. Ask him where my car is, why he hasn't called me for two weeks, what he's done with my cheque, when I'm going to see him again, and what the hell he thinks he's doing. Did you get all of that, dear? I think so. Who shall I say called? There can't be many people who would leave a message like that. He'll know. Goodbye. Message 6, 11.34. Grayson, Worldwide Trading. Can you put me through to Mr. Grayson, please? He's not here at the moment. Can I take a message? Yes. This is the Top Type Secretarial Agency. I'm phoning to inquire about our bills, which haven't been met. Bills? What were they for? For? He's had three temporary secretaries and we haven't received a penny. I've only been here an hour. I'm from the A1 Agency. Really? Well, I'd just leave him my message and not waste any more of your time. The Language of Rock Just 
The Frankenstein Robot. This week, Film Horizons has an action-packed bill for you. We're going to see extracts from Lucas Simon's latest film, Interplanetary Patrol, and from the new Clive Westwood production, Gunfire at Dusk. Our nostalgia section looks at horror films of the 1930s, but let's waste no time. We're beginning with an interview with Lucas Simon, whose Interplanetary Patrol goes on general release this week. I spoke to him earlier today at Heathrow Airport. Here we are at London's Heathrow Airport, where Lucas Simon has just landed from Los Angeles. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Simon. Where's that car? I've got to be at a meeting by four o'clock. Uh, could you let us have a few words, Mr. Simon? Yeah, get the hell out of my way. I'm Jason Phillips from the BBC. We're recording for Film Horizons and... Hell! Yeah, oh, why didn't you say so before? I'd just like to say, I love your cute little country, and I'm very pleased to be here. Isn't that right, Jake? Jason. That's right. Uh, could you tell us about your new film? Sure. It's being produced right here in England, as you know. Is it going to be another space movie? I feel it's time for a new direction. Interplanetary Patrol was my last space adventure. The new one will be called The Frankenstein Robot. The Frankenstein Robot? That's it. It's said in the 26th century, when this scientist, who happens to be the great-great-great-grandson of Dr. Frankenstein, well, he decides that the robots are being sold at too high a price. You see, the whole civilization depends on robots. Anyway, he reckons he can make a robot much cheaper by using bits of dead bodies instead of silicon chips and computers and that kind of thing, right? I thought you said it wasn't going to be a space movie. That's right. It's not a space movie, but it is science fiction. Uh, what about the director? There have been reports of a row between you and Charles Olson. No comment. I'll just say it was going to be directed by Charles Olson, but now it'll be directed by one of America's best up-and-coming directors, Trevor Inchelstone. Trevor Inchelstone? Hmm? I've never heard of him. He's my son-in-law. A truly great director. What about the cast? It's been reported here that the leading role will be played by Steve Newman. That was true. It certainly was. Last week. Now we're hoping the part will be played by Lewis London. Lewis London? Isn't he your brother-in-law? Right. Did you see him in Dracula Meets King Kong? A truly moving performance. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, didn't he play Count Dracula? No, son. He played King Kong. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what about the female lead? Uh, I know a lot of newspapers thought it would be acted by Kay Spark. I thought so, too. Unfortunately, she was too busy. She's on holiday. So I think it'll be played by Moira Hammond. Isn't she your wife? She is. She is. It sounds like a, a family show. You could say that, James. You certainly could. Uh, Jason, uh, my name's Jason. I, that's what I said. Uh, would you like to comment on reports from New York that financial support has been withdrawn from the film uh, due to changes in casting? Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Where's my car? Uh, Mr. Simon, Mr. Simon... Well, uh, that seems to be all from Heathrow Airport, so back to the studio. Anything to declare? Simply put, the average traveler is very average. He has two cases, and the things in those cases accurately reflect his position in life and his journey. Let's say he's a businessman back from Europe. He may have had a rather complex journey, been to a few capitals over there. 
His cases will have a fair bit of paperwork in them. He'll have a couple of pairs of shoes, good shoes, and a Brooks Brothers suit or whatever, uh, three or four silk ties, and a good selection of shirts and socks, all neatly laundered by a hotel. There will be a little stack of laundered handkerchiefs and a couple of hardcover books. Now, if he's an oil man, even a fairly senior one, he'll be very different. If his travels have taken him to the North Sea, he'll have bought a couple of tartan rugs, for certain. They all do. He's going to have slacks, maybe a plaid jacket, and sports shirts, and a pair of boots. He may have a paperback and a shooting or hunting magazine, and almost certainly a couple of bottles of straight malt whiskey. Don't ask me why oil men have dirty laundry. Maybe Scottish hotels won't do it. When we get somebody whose luggage doesn't match his appearance or his story or his route, then we get curious. Like with Pan Am 800. Why should people carrying light clothes, slacks, and short-sleeved shirts be coming from Tokyo in February? Why should they have suntan oil in the toilet kits? Because they started out from Colombia. They may claim to be students. What is a student doing in Tokyo in February? He's surely not on vacation. So where is he studying? Or a businessman. So how come he's not carrying lots of papers, commercial samples, sales aids? Smugglers never accumulate all the rubbish in their cases that an ordinary traveler does. Phrase books, torn street maps, half-filled-in postcards, used rolls of film, hotel receipts, book matches, curios, presents for the children. And they can make real fools of themselves. They'll say, Columbia? Where's that? And then you point out that their shirt wrappers, back to shirts again, are labeled Bogota Hotel, or that their toothpaste or shaving cream is Colombian. You get some who are so stupid that they don't even fill their suitcases. They seem to think that we won't find it odd that they are traveling with an empty case. Those who fill them often get the mix wrong. There will be masses of clothes, but not heavier shoes or books. The clothes themselves are often suspicious. Shirts of different sizes. Trousers that don't seem they would fit the passenger. Labels with little giveaways. End call. Colombian made. Or all the other clothes will obviously be new. Or they don't suit the personality of the owner. We had one, a macho type. And he had all dull gabardine trousers and chunky sweaters. Totally out of character. Though the cocaine we found wasn't. It takes a lot of skill to fool a man who's been looking at suitcases for 15 years. Door-to-door -door salesman. Yes? Mrs. Curtis? Yes? You don't know me. I'm an educational consultant. Oh. And I wonder if I could talk to you about your children's future. My children's future? Well, uh... Could I come in for a moment? Well, I don't... Uh... Thank you. I won't take much of your time. I'm sure you're very busy. No, no. I was just making a cup of tea. <laughs> That's very kind of you. I never say no to a cup of tea. Uh, just one, sugar. Hmm. There you are. Oh, thank you. Is uh, Mr. Curtis at home? No, I'm afraid he isn't. He's at work. He won't be home till late. And the children? They're at school, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Which school do they go to? Walston Primary, just up the road. And how old are they? Gary's eight and Julia's ten. How are Gary and Julia doing at school? All right. About average, I suppose. They seem to be very happy there. 
Only average, eh? Hmm. Do you think they could do better? I don't think so. I'm sure they're doing their best. Anyway, we leave that up to the teachers. But I'm sure you want your children to do well, don't you, Mrs Curtis? I mean, it's only natural to want the best for one's children, isn't it? I suppose Gary and Julia read a lot at home. Well, not a lot. They watch the telly a lot. And they bring books home from school. Mm, but that's not the same as having your own books at home, is it? Research has shown that children who read lots of books at home do better at school, you know. Reading's very important. I'm sure it is. We sometimes buy them books for Christmas. Yes, but what kind of books? Uh, let me show you this. Just look at that for a moment and tell me what you think of it. Mmm, that's beautiful. The pictures are lovely. And it's not just the pictures, Mrs Curtis. All human knowledge is there. Everything your children might want to know on every subject under the sun. All in this book? No, no. Now, that's just one volume. Oh. There are 40 volumes. It took over 20 years to produce it. It must be very expensive. Well, they are, usually. But this month, I'm in a position to offer very generous terms. Just for this month, I can give a 20% discount. Those books will never be so cheap again. Well, I don't know. I'm sure we can't afford it. Things are a bit difficult at the moment. But these books are an investment in your children's future. You can't really put a price on that, can you, Mrs Curtis? No, I suppose not. I don't know. I... I mean, you want your children to do well, don't you? Yes, but we haven't got that kind of money, you see. Not many people have these days, Mrs Curtis. But I can make payment very easy for you. You just pay a small deposit and then a small payment every month. That's how other parents pay. Oh, I see. And the terms are very reasonable, I can assure you. Well, I just don't know. The books are very nice, I'm sure, and the kids would love them. But I usually let my husband deal with... Yes, I understand that, Mrs Curtis, and I would never dream of asking you to commit yourself finally. You just sign this form, we send you the books, and if you change your mind, you can always send them back. Well, I don't know what to do. I really don't. You wouldn't regret it, you know. I can give my word. An offer like this will never come along again. And I know the price is going up at the end of the month. All right. Where do I sign? Uh, just there, Mrs Curtis. That's right. It's the best investment you've ever made.